Good afternoon, folks. My name is Boyd Stevenson with the National Tank Truck Carriers, and welcome to our webinar, Cleaning Tank Trailers, Safety in Confined Spaces. This afternoon's webinar is the first in the series of webinars, part of NTU, NTTC's new Tank Truck University. Uh, we do have a few others scheduled that I am very excited to let you know about. Um, that will be at the end of the program, however. In the meantime, I would like to get us straight into our presentations. Uh, the good news is that Lance Hagler from TriMac Transportation is on the line and ready to talk to folks uh, about this important issue related to cleaning tank trailers. Dan Wright is having uh, a few technical issues, so I'm actually going to mute myself in just a moment, and we're going to work on getting him added, but uh, in the moment Dan may or may not be available. I will let everyone know that if you're having any problems at any time, uh, in the bottom right you have something that looks like a little smiley face. You can click on that and uh, go to I Need Assistance, and that will be visible to everyone uh, or to me, and I will get you taken care of. Uh, same thing if you need to get some, uh, or if you want to ask a question of the presenters. Uh, yes. Barry Denom, I will be right in touch with you. Uh, if you need to ask a question of the presenters, same exact menu, only you click Raise Hand. Um, if whatever issue is taken care of, if you ask a question and someone else has already asked it, uh, you go to the same place, click Clear My Status, and you are good to go. Uh, with that, Dan, I'm going to, or sorry, Lance, I'm going to get off of this and. Uh, let you get started with the presentation. I again want to thank you and Dan uh, in advance for putting this together. Uh, this is a hugely important topic, and uh, at that point, or, uh, and then we'll go ahead and uh, let you get started. So, thank you, Lance. All right, thanks, Boyd. Really appreciate. Uh, first of all, I want to thank NTTC for the opportunity. Also, want to thank uh, the CTRMC, which both Dan and myself are, are members of, for a lot of the materials that you're going to see today. So a couple of things that I wanted to mention before we get started is that this webinar is not meant to be a training or it's not meant to identify every procedural step necessary to be incident free. So really this is meant to provide tips and informational um, guidance on how to make the confined space process safer specifically to tank entry. So if you look at the screen, um, I'll move forward here. So in 2017, we've had a couple uh, very tragic events. Two people have been killed so far this year. We had a worker in Oakville, Ontario, who died earlier this year uh, during a confined space entry. I don't have a lot of details on that at this point. Also, a worker in Pleasant Valley, Missouri, was found unresponsive inside a tank truck and later passed away. This worker was a veteran employee and was in the process of, of cleaning a tank. So between those two incidents and also a tragic event from, from 2016, it really raised our, our level of awareness and really wanted us to bring uh, more information to the industry. Because many of us here may not be involved in confined space entries, but we're all part of the supply chain uh, of which that confined space entries and tank cleaning uh, is vital. I personally define a world-class culture as having the necessity to find hazards and an urgency to address those hazards at all levels. And so we can't stop every hazard and we can't see every entry that goes on uh, in our industry. But what we can do is be aware of the steps. And we can strive to make safety part of every decision uh, for each employee as well. Uh, so these were the two events that happened in 2017. If you go back to 2016, also uh, two men died in 2016 as well uh, in Texas. They were in their 20s had a life ahead of them. The way to prevent confined space fatalities and injuries is an adherence to a well-established process. All of the people that I just mentioned who died, they had friends, they had families, and this is going to affect many people for the rest of their lives. Obviously their lives were cut short, but we're going to affect a lot of folks in our industry because of this. Injuries and especially fatalities, they're not just expenses, they're not just work disruptions but they affect a son being able to play catch with their dad because he has a shoulder injury or a mom who has a, a knee injury and can't bend down 
to draw on the sidewalk with chalk with her daughter. Those are the real world, the real world applications and, and the real world effects that injuries have. Forget fatalities for a moment, but just injuries. And so everybody on this call and everybody in our injury, or I'm, I'm sorry, everybody in the industry, our goal has to be zero. We don't want to have those effects on people's lives. Safety is personal to a lot of people who don't walk through our doors every day or go to our delivery sites or climb into our trucks. So unlike a van trailer, we can't simply open the door to a cargo tank and take chemicals on and off with a forklift or a hand truck. So we have to open up a trailer and we have to pressure off material uh, with a pump, a compressor, something like that. So tank trailers are complex. So here are some common hazards that occur in tank washing, which again, like I mentioned, was a, is just a vital piece of, of the entire supply chain. Um, first of all, working at heights, it's a very common hazard to, to clean a tank trailer. You gotta pour material into the top of material, water, cleaning solution, those kind of things. Um, there's pressure involved with tank washing. Both the tank washes themselves have boilers that are on site, boilers that are used to uh, heat up water. And then also we have cargo tanks that come into a facility that used to have pressure in them and may still have pressure at the point of cleaning as well. Um, obviously there's slip and fall hazards. Uh, a trailer's being cleaned with water or a cleaning solution, so the floor could be wet. Uh, we not, may not be able to see product, product residue that's on the floor as well. Um, obviously, again, there's a chemical presence with tank washing. Um, we're cleaning material out that was just delivered to a particular place. Um, cleaning has uh, several advantages. Um, I would say just, just vital pieces to the entire industry. I mean, obviously, cleaning reduces chemical reactions down the road. So cleaning is important, um, but it's also it also has a lot of ha a lot of hazards as well. And the last thing that, that I wanted to discuss is obviously the confined space entry. Confined space is is part of the process um, in some cases, and it's really the purpose for this webinar as well. So let's talk a little bit about why confined space entry is needed in tank cleaning. So first of all, when we say cleaning a tank, when we get inside of one of those. We, we have to get inside to investigate if, if the tank is, uh, if, if after we've cleaned it, if it's clean to the extent that we need it. We all talk about uh, clean, dry, and, and odor free. So we have to make sure that has occurred. Um, and we also have to make sure that, um, that there isn't any residue in there um, that wasn't able to be removed with the pressure of water through a spinner device. Um, and, and that way a person just has to get inside to see that. And so there has to be an entry of some sort to make sure that the trailer is cleaned as well as it needed to be. Um, just like we mentioned, like I mentioned before, is um, if we don't clean this well enough, there is a, a potential for a reaction down the road. And so cleaning is very vital for safety steps that occur uh, down the road from, from cleaning for the next delivery as well. Um, this webinar is really about cleaning and the confined space entry that comes from tank cleaning. But also I want everybody to be aware that many tank cleaning uh, locations, wash racks as many of us call them, um, they have shops that are on site as well. And so those shops deal with a lot of inspection and repair. So there are internal inspections that are actually required by the federal government. And many times we have to repair the inside of tanks as well. And so you can't do that without getting inside um, to repair pits, damage, the kind of things that go along with bulk transportation over time. Um, our trailers are not just used for a year or two and then replaced. Um, they're big, expensive pieces of equipment that in our industry is used for a long period of time. So the inspection and repair is just vital uh, to, to making sure the equipment is safe down the road. Again, um, like we mentioned before, uh, confined space is necessary, but we want to reduce that wherever we can. The best prevention of fatalities and injuries is to eliminate the need for an entry. Um, if you look at the, uh, the, the hazard triangle, really the top, if we eliminate a hazard, then you eliminate the risk of an injury or a fatality. PPE is lower on the list, um, 
It's the same way as, you know, we don't wear a helmet uh, in order to prevent injuries from crashes. We try to teach defensive driving habits as well. Eliminating that hazard would be to eliminate all cars off the road. Um, but we can't do that. Eliminating, eliminating the hazards are, are hard. And so we want to do as much as we can through our procedures, good training, um, and engineering controls to make sure that we reduce the hazard just as much as we can. So we talked about why we do confined space, what hazards are available in a, or what hazard present in a tank wash. Let's talk about confined space itself and what, why is that even risky? Uh, a few reasons. One, the worker can't easily escape. Um, we're really talking about a permit required confined space for the purpose of uh, this, this uh, webinar. Um, and, and what OSHA defines as a permit required confined space is, is a, a few elements here. So it contains or has the potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere. Um, it contains a material that has the potential for, the potential for engulfing uh, the person who's inside. Um, and, and also it contains some other hazards that, that we may not be able to distinguish that maybe only the carrier or the, the tank cleaning folks or the employees there can, can identify. And so speaking from that, really all tank trailer confined space entries are going to be permit required confined space because there's a, a prior chemical presence uh, that's inside of there. That's why we test the atmosphere. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, and then those materials could engulf uh, the, the person who's inside. And also, it's not easy to get outside of a tank. There's really one way in, one way out. Um, there's slippery surfaces inside as well, so somebody could fall down, hit their head, be incapacitated, even if there's no chemical exposure. Um, you need retrieval systems, and to be fair, retrieval systems can be difficult to put on, can be difficult to operate to get somebody out. Um, they're necessary, uh, they're vital, and they're required, but they can be difficult to use. The last piece here that's important is also nitrogen. So one of the most riskiest things about a confined space entry uh, is, is nitrogen in, in tank cleaning. Really because nitrogen is used a lot, especially in chemical bulk trucking. And, and really, if you look at the whole, the, whole, uh, the whole process, job task observations are just vital to ensure that we have a safe confined space program. Job task observations or the application of behavior-based safety. You've got to know what you're looking for. You've got to watch the process. Make sure that, that employees are following the safe process. And also, we're not doing the things that lead to more risk. All right, so I mentioned nitrogen as probably one of the largest dangers. If you talk to folks who work in a tank wash, they're going to tell you that nitrogen scares them more than anything else. And so I wanted to talk through why nitrogen is even used in our industry. Um, nitrogen reduces oxygen. Um, and it takes away one of the three elements of the combustion triangle or the fire triangle, depending on who, who trained you. Um, that's one of the major things there. So the fire triangle uh, has elements of if you have oxygen, you have heat, and you have fuel, you have the potential for a fire. And so to take one of those elements away, that's how you extinguish a fire. It's also how you reduce the risk of a fire. So nitrogen provides uh, the ability to reduce the risks of flammable or combustible materials. It also, <clears throat> it also provides for moisture control. Some materials that are delivered can't be, uh, can't be in contact with moisture. They harden up. Um, or it provides a level of reaction. So nitrogen is used either inside of the trailer or is used to pressure off the material that's inside the trailer. Last but not least, uh, nitrogen is also used in transloading. Could be from a rail to truck or from truck to truck. A lot of different employees uh, in the tank truck industry are exposed to nitrogen. It's not just, uh, it's not just um, people within uh, tank washes. So we can have drivers that are exposed to, to nitrogen as well. Tank wash technicians, obviously, mechanics. Um, folks, when we go load and unload, when carriers go load at a shipper or unload at a constantly a, de a destination point, those folks are involved in the process and may, may be in contact with nitrogen in one way or the other. We may be using uh, nitrogen that's at a delivery site uh, to unload product. A lot of different things. Obviously, emergency responders, uh, transloaders, are exposed to nitrogen. So what is nitrogen in general? Why does it pose a hazard? Why are folks in the tank washing business so concerned and so scared of nitrogen? 
Well, first of all, it's colorless. And I, I'm not going to read everything. If you can see my screen, I, I'm not going to read everything on here. Um, but we're all breathing nitrogen right now. Uh, it's not dangerous because it's it's not dangerous right now because it's mixed with the proper amount of oxygen to sustain life. So even though we're breathing it right now, it's it's fine. So nitrogen makes up about 78% of the Earth's atmosphere. We can't smell it and we can't detect a nitrogen only atmosphere. And with no oxygen, if we're breathing straight nitrogen and no oxygen, because like I mentioned, Nitrogen is used to, to reduce oxygen in an atmosphere. So if we breathe nitrogen only, we won't detect it, and then our body's going to shut down. And that is uh, something that we don't want to happen. And that's where you get into a situation where we have to rescue somebody. Um, the body shuts down, they're not breathing, and we can only go so long uh, and sustain life without breathing. We can't just hold our breath. Um, some believe that you can hold your breath and attempt to rescue. Um, without that stimulus to breathe, everything in the body stops. So many times with a confined space death, you will see more than one because somebody has tried to rush into a situation without following the procedures and they run into an atmosphere that has no oxygen and then they collapse too. And then we can't get out, um, it, by we, I mean emergency responders, our industry, we can't get somebody, we can't get both people out at the same time. So many times you'll see two fatalities from one particular event. And in fact, at the beginning of the presentation, uh, you saw the, the event that I was talking about in Texas, that happened there as well. Okay, so like I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, this is not meant to be a, we're all training uh, to the um, confined space regulations, OSHA regulations, all those kind of things. This is meant to be some common tips uh, of, of how to. Sorry about that. This is meant to be um, common tips uh, to make sure that we have an effective uh, program in general. So I'm really going to be talking about atmospheric testing because I think this is really the cornerstone of an effective program. We've got to test the atmosphere properly. So there's an order of testing. So when we do the testing, which again is required before we get into a confined space, the atmosphere has to be tested. So um, we have to test first for oxygen, second for a flammable material, and third for any toxic levels. And so for those of you that don't know, the, uh, the atmospheric testing you're going to do with a small device, um, we do it prior to any entry. It's also done throughout the entry as well. It's done continuously. But that device may have a straw on the end of it. It's what it's called, a tube of some sort that reaches into that trailer. And we'll talk about where you measure or where you test the atmosphere in the trailer in a minute. But this is what the device looks like. You can see it um, right here. But we've got to test throughout, um, throughout the entry because things can change. We can run into a pocket of nitrogen, a pocket of something that's there that we may not have seen beforehand. And also, this is where stratification comes into. Stratification is those pockets of air. Pockets of air. We there, Boyd? Oh, we had a technical difficulty there for a minute. I had a lot of feedback. I think that may be uh, our third presenter. We've got him in, and he's just uh, trying to log in his audio. But uh, uh, keep going, and once we've got him hooked in, we'll... Uh, We'll move forward on that. Okay, thanks, Boyd. So moving along, um, just the stratification. This is a pretty busy slide right here. But bottom line is there are some things that rise in an atmosphere and some things that level at the bottom. Nitrogen tends to to sit at the bottom of a in this in this example uh, a cargo tank. So nitrogen is going to sit at the bottom. It's going to lay down. It's going to be a little bit heavier than air. And so this just shows some different things that tend to rise or lay down in an atmosphere. And that's what we're looking for with stratification. And that's why testing of that atmosphere is, is vital um, to making sure we have a safe entry before somebody even gets in there.
Communication on the other. All right, I think uh, if, if, if folks can hear us, I think we have Dan Wright on the line now. Dan, are, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can. We've got a lot of background noise. Uh, okay, then let's, let's switch it back to Lance. Lance, go ahead and take it over. I got background. I... All right, Lance, can you go ahead and... Uh, and, and pop back on. I, I apologize, folks. Please bear with us. Lance, you there? Yeah, I'm back here, Boyd. Excellent. Thanks so much. We, we tried, and I'm glad we got Dan on. But uh, And Dan, you, of course, can certainly raise uh, uh, points via the chat. But I think we've got uh, Lance's audio is, is, feed is, is, is definitely uh, probably what we need. Thanks very much, folks, and Lance, back to you. Okay, thanks, Boyd. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties, everybody. Um, so we were talking about stratification, and we were talking about when stratification is likely. Well, when it's not likely is one of uh, three situations that you see here on the screen. So if we have good ventilation in any area, and this isn't just with a tank trailer, but if you have good ventilation, you're less likely to have stratification because that air is moving. It's going to kick out those pockets of of nitrogen or and something else that could be underneath there. If you have shallow pits, there's not much place um, for the air to move in and out of, and so you can it can move in and out of there very easily. And then also, we eliminate the stratification of a cargo tank um, with powered ventilation, and that's why if you're doing a confined space entry, powered ventilation is very important to move air uh, throughout there. We can test the atmosphere, and so we know before we get in there that uh, the atmosphere has the level of oxygen uh, that's necessary, and we're looking from about 19.5% of oxygen to 23.5% of oxygen. Normal air has around 21% oxygen. So as long as, as we're looking for something to be in that, in that area, we're not going to go in that tank trailer unless it's in that area. However, that powered ventilation is going to make sure that there were pockets um, that we can catch because it's very difficult to, to, to test every complete inch of that trailer. And so that's why the ventilation moves everything through there. This whole process is about reducing risk because as we discussed, we could eliminate the risk by not going in there, but we have everything from government regulations to future safety concerns uh, that's going to require us uh, to, to go into a trailer. One thing that our drivers encounter and, and, and that our drivers have seen is that leaning in can be just as dangerous as entering. A, a quick story that one of our drivers um, saw a customer's employee when he went to load, the customer's employee opened the dome and started to stick his head inside of the dome lid. And our driver stopped him, obviously knowing about the dangers of this. But um, you know, it's not just drivers and, and tank wash technicians that could be exposed to this. So um, he knew the dangers of, of leaning into that tank trailer. And really, once you cross that plane, that is a confined space entry. Once the, the plane is crossed of the dome lid, we're getting inside the vessel itself. It's now a confined space entry. So if you're observing folks, if you're observing drivers, tank wash technicians, we never lean into a trailer. Um, just leaning in can provide uh, so much danger. If your head enters the space, you could become incapacitated and actually fall in the trailer. So if that is an oxygen-rich environment, uh, it's, it's key that we stay outside of that environment until we test and we do all the right things that our programs require. So to, to sum up everything we've just talked about, here's, here's a few highlights. I'm not going to read everything here on the screen, um, but the main things are have a plan and train to the plan. Your confined space training or anybody's confined space training has to be some of the most hands-on and 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 data-filled training that you have. We've got to provide the right information to folks because this is one of the most dangerous things that occurs uh, in the industry is confined space entry. And, and also drills are essential to being able to rescue someone. Um, you've got to know how the equipment works, you've got to test that it works, and folks have to know how to use it. So those drills are extremely important. 
And also, involving local emergency responders with drills uh, is key as well, because those they're going to be able to give some insight uh, into how to do rescues, because frankly, in our industry, we don't do these rescues all that often. And so practice is important. We're only going to practice every so often, too. We're not going to practice uh, every day, either. We're not going to have a full, confined space mock drill every day. So any tips and keys that we can get uh, from emergency responders who do rescue folks on a daily basis. It may not be from a cargo tank, but they do rescue folk on, folks on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. They do it definitely more than we do. Any of those tips are, are going to be key. And I can tell you personally, there was once we had a drill and we found a, a retrieval device that wasn't working properly through the drill. And I was sold on drills before, but that just made me think just how important these drills are and it just showed everybody involved how critical it is. I mean, we've caught things uh, through mock confined space drills, just that our reaction time uh, to uh, a man down was not uh, was was not as quick as we'd wanted. We found this uh, particular device that wasn't working properly. We've we've uh, found folks that didn't quite understand the process as we had trained them to. And what that does is, you know, we're able to find that before an incident occurs, before an injury, or definitely before a fatality. And that's what drilling is all about, to find these things out before we get to that particular situation. Okay. So since many of us are, are carriers on this call, not everybody on the call operates a tank wash or has even been in a tank wash. Um, I thought that, that we would provide some information on what carriers can do to assist with the process. Even though you may not operate a tank wash, you may not have employees uh, in a tank wash, it's important for carriers to know what a motor carrier can do. When you drop that trailer off at the tank wash, what you can do to make sure that the process is safe uh, for the tank wash uh, employee. So I had some discussions with some folks at, at, at our tank washes um, to see, you know, what if you had to provide that information to carriers, what, what would you tell them? So the first thing I got was ensure that accurate information is communicated to the tank cleaning facility. Uh, that was number one. Um, make sure that you're aware uh, is, is the tank completely empty, is there product left in it? Um, do we do we give the right information of what product is in there? Because I can tell you, we've had information uh, given to us that was incorrect, that we were told the wrong product was in there, you know, those kind of things. So the accurate information is essential to a safe process. Now, every tank wash who does things the right way is going to take that trailer and they're going to assume the worst. Um, but the more information that you can give us, and, and actually the accurate information is, is really critical. And in addition, um, if you have nitrogen on there, tagging is, is uh, extremely helpful for folks involved. Now, I know there's arguments on both sides of it. Some folks would say, well, don't tag it because it gives a false sense of security. But in my opinion, and I know Dan's not on here, but Dan and I have, have discussed this at length, and we both agree that any additional safety flags, safety information that you can give us about the trailer is, is very helpful. Again, we're going to treat that trailer as if it has nitrogen on it. We're going to test the atmosphere. We're going to do our confined space permit. We're going to do all the things um, that we need to do. We're not going to enter in if it's dirty. We're going to do all those things that we need to do. Um, but any additional information that you can give us about the status of that particular cargo tank uh, is critical and, and well received. Always give the safety data sheet to the tank cleaning facility. Um, it may seem absurd, but sometimes uh, tank cleaning facilities may have a hard time getting an SDS from every carrier that drops a trailer there. So, you know, it's essential for your driver to know the, the hazards of a product, the PPE required for a particular product, um, what accidental release measures and everything that corresponds to that product. It's, it's, it's critical that your driver knows that, but it's also critical that the tank wash knows that. So make sure that the tank wash, uh, the tank cleaning facility has a SDS, has an SDS for that particular product that you're getting cleaned out. Um, also ensure, this kind of corresponds to the first bullet point, but ensure that the tank cleaning facility has accurate information uh, on the product last contained too. Um, again, like I mentioned, we've been given information that's, that's incorrect on that. Um, and inform your drivers of the tank cleaning facility's confined space procedures. Uh, I'm not saying that your drivers need to go through a half-day training course on confined space, but any tank wash that you call up and say, you know what, we want to know a little bit more about your confined space procedures so we can better, we can better educate our drivers on what to expect uh, when we get there. 
Um, that's key. So the more the more you know about hazards, the more likely your drivers, your supervisors, your frontline folks are are, are they're going to be more helpful in reducing those hazards on the tank cleaning end as well. And again, your tank cleaning facility would be more than happy uh, to explain what goes on with their procedures. Uh, and the last thing um, that I wanted to cover, just ensure that you know the disposition of your trailers and communicate properly. So imagine this scenario. If um, you have a, if you're a carrier and you have a driver that for some reason doesn't deliver a load, okay, is supposed to deliver a load and then that particular product requires cleaning right after the load is delivered, the trailer has to be cleaned out. So imagine if that trailer's not delivered um, or the product is not delivered, but the driver doesn't communicate that back to you and then goes and just puts the trailer where he always puts the trailer, if this is a common delivery, just on the ready line at the tank wash. Um, so that, that adds a hazard in the process is that the tank wash uh, sees a trailer there um, that's normally supposed to be cleaned and the carrier doesn't even know that this product is still loaded. We could have six, seven, eight thousand gallons of product in here and not know that, it, that it's in there. Nobody is really aware except for that driver. So knowing what goes on, knowing the disposition of your trailers is key because that information again can be communicated back to the tank wash. In that scenario, if you know about it, if your supervisors, your managers know that product was not delivered, you can communicate that to the tank wash. The tank wash knows, okay, trailer one, two, three, four, five is now sitting on our property. It's filled with product and it wasn't supposed to be. So please don't try to wash that trailer. So knowing the disposition of your trailers and your product uh, is essential. And also that communication with the tank cleaning facility uh, is, is, is really key to making sure uh, that, that an incident does not occur. And so just added some resources where we've got uh, some of this information at. Again, thank you to the, uh, the CTRMC uh, for the information uh, that we were provided. Everything from nitrogen um, to a lot of the information you see here came from uh, the Cargo Tank Risk Management Committee. And with that being said, Boyd, that's all I have. Well, thank you very much. We really, really appreciate it. We've got uh, Dan on in, in, a, in a typing capacity, although not in an audio one, so he may have some, some words uh, in, in the chat. I will also bring everyone's attention to another document uh, that is available. Uh, it is the OSHA Procedures for Atmospheric Testing in Confined Spaces. Uh, Lance and Dan have uh, shared this. Both of these should be downloadable for you. Uh, you'll notice there is a little uh, arrow uh, right next to uh, right next to the the file, uh, so you can definitely you, you can do that in that particular way to download them. Uh, the presentations are there. There will also be um, information coming out afterwards. Uh, that will allow you to get, uh, in addition to the slides for this uh, and the OSHA fact sheet, uh, there will also be links to allow you to watch and rewatch the webinar uh, at your leisure. Um, at this point in time, if there are any questions for Dan and Lance, down in the very bottom right of your menu, you can see that there is a button that looks sort of like a smiley face. Uh, in there, there is a uh, a choice that says raise hand. Uh, anyone that goes ahead and does that, we will certainly recognize you and give you an opportunity uh, to ask questions of Lance and Dan. Uh, Going to give everyone a little while to do that right now. Um, I will in fact go ahead and uh, Well, that's not going to that's not going to do. But um, it is down at the bottom right. I am not showing any questions at this point in time. Uh, so we will. Uh, oh, we've got we do have a question in the chat from Chris Kellogg. Can you discuss rescue plans and what you know is needed in case of an emergency? Lance, uh, you want to go ahead and take that? I wish uh, you know. <laughs> I wish Dan. I wish Dan was available here because Dan and I have had some great discussions on this. But one of the, the key things here that's the most important thing for me that I see 
it, with the rescue plan in the case of an emergency is that you have a retrieval device that works well. So you have somebody who is inside the trailer that is attached to a retrieval device that not only works properly, but people know how to use it. So that retrieval device is absolutely key to making sure that you can get somebody out quickly. Without that retrieval device, you may have to send somebody else in there. And that is not at all what we want to do. That's not what the fire department does. And plus, if we don't have a retrieval device that works properly, then we're also going to have an issue um, that the fire department's gear can't get in the top of the trailer many times. So the retrieval device is key. It's got to be a key part of, uh, of, of your rescue. And then also, we need to let everybody know at the facility that there is somebody inside there so that everybody could help and everybody has to have a, a designated part uh, to the rescue. We don't need additional people there. We don't need 100 people stepping over themselves, but um, the right people need to be there, and we need to have equipment uh, that works to get somebody out of a trailer. Thanks, Lance. Our next question comes from Becky Perlacki. Um, and she says, I know Dan wanted to make certain that the fire department is involved in your retrieval rescue, rescue drills to ensure they can enter the vehicle safely. They may have the long, narrow air bottles to assist. Uh, and with that, uh, we also have a voice question from Tim Grisham. Uh, Tim, you are... Uh, you're, we're, we're hooking you in. Your, your phone should uh, unmute, uh, and you should be able to ask a question. Tim? You there? All right. Uh, just, just, to throw in what, not. just to throw in what Becky had mentioned, uh, Boyd, um, that's why I mentioned the, using your local emergency responders uh, during the presentation, um, but that really means your fire department. The fire department is key. They're going to give you some insight into your rescue plan that you may not know about because they're used to rescuing people. We are not. And so um, one of the things that came out is just that, that uh, you can, they might not have the right equipment. You know, if you've got a fire station that's going to respond in case of a confined space entry um, issue, they may, they may not have the right equipment to respond and help you out. And so this helps them just as much as it helps us as well. Um, and I know Dan is very passionate about that, and, and rightfully so. So using, uh, using the fire department is really critical. Thanks very much, Lance. Um, we've still got Tim Grisham. We, your audio line is still open. Um, uh, again, if you if you don't have a uh, uh, if your audio is not working via your phone, uh, you are certainly welcome to type your question in. Uh, otherwise, we will go ahead and move on. All right. Um, we do have a question from Carla Finley. Uh, asking about an oil truck carrying K1 and the retrieval system, uh, what is the best way to open the tank? Lance? Okay, repeat that question again. I'm sorry, it broke up a little bit. Sure, it's, uh, it's actually in the bottom of the chat, um, and it does say, uh, let's say an oil truck that carries K1 and the retrieval system will not work, what is the best way to open the tank? Yeah, I wish I could answer that, Carla. That's uh, that's pretty specific there, and I, I I can't answer that. That would require a little bit of uh, a little bit of research on my part. But um, I do know enough to say I don't know. Uh, oh, Tim's question: Can you discuss some of the fall protection issues that we run across for getting on top of the tank? Great, great question. Great question. Um, so. Some of the issues that we run into, specifically in a tank wash, the tank wash is going to have installed fall protection that's there. So we're going to have tank uh, fall protection that runs uh, the length of the bays. Um, your, your tank wash um, technicians are going to uh, put on a harness and they're going to have fall protection um, that protects them while they're on the top of the tank. 
one of the things that we run into in the industry is that uh, when drivers go on top of the tanks to do things like uh, check dome lid securement and then also uh, clean out cap securement, we, they don't have fall protection at every facility where they go. And so drivers specifically are exposed uh, to fall protection issues. And so really from a tank wash perspective, um, they do have fall protection provided. Um, that fall protection is a little bit more at risk only because uh, you're in an environment with a lot of uh, corrosion that can happen, a lot of uh, moisture in the air, you know, those kind of things. Um, but specifically drivers, when they have to go up there and check securement, they're not always protected. All right, Mary Grace Gatamy asked whether or not you should place someone outside of the tank uh, in case where workers become incapacitated during cleaning. Absolutely, very good question. So that's also one of the requirements of confined space entry. That person outside is called an attendant. And so the attendant has to be outside of there. There has to be somebody, let me take this back, there's got to be somebody monitoring what's going on inside the, the trailer at all times. So. Um, that's really important that person's going to operate the retrieval device and they're also there talking to the person making sure that they're responding back because at some point if they start trying to talk to them and that person's not responding it's very difficult to know when when somebody is incapacitated that's in the tank so you got to have somebody monitoring that great Lance um, this one may get a little uh, technical so uh, Lance may uh, refer this question back to uh, check with the CFRs, uh, but when a permit is required for a co confined space and then it's, it's been deemed safe, so a permit's not required, what are the requirements for the entrant uh, as far as remaining in the safety harness uh, during the inspection and work process, again, after the uh, permit is no longer required? Um, I can't really answer that because uh, from, from my experience, we don't go inside of there uh, without a permit. So we're not going to downgrade an entry to a non-permit required entry. So that's a, a technical thing that I'm, I'm not really sure of. But very good question. Wish I could answer it, but I, I don't know that answer. Thanks. Um, Travis O'Banion was, was popping in. He, he's raised his hands a couple times, but uh, it, it, it pops away. Travis, uh, if, if, not, uh, uh, if, if not, we can certainly move over to some of the other questions uh, about recommending testing the atmosphere. Chris Kellogg asked, um, should you check your atmosphere for levels of parts per million of the chemical prior to in entering? So not just checking the oxygen or the LEL, but should you be checking for PPM of a specific uh, chemical inside the tank. I got to read through that. This is Dan. Can you hear me? That question. That one's hard uh, through just text. I'm not sure I understand the question. And, and I, hate to, I hate to keep passing these off. And Dan can... Wright appears to have joined us, and he is coming through loud and clear. Oh, okay. I finally got on. Oh, good. There we go, Dan. Uh, one of the, one of the things when you're checking. When we, if you're a, if you've got a chemical, we, one of the things we do for a permit entry, you check prior product that was in the trailer. So if that prior product is is the point where you must get down and, and find out the parts per million to check for that because it may be coming up, it, it could be a carcinogenic that you're you're getting into. Uh, we always try to get into the trailers being clean, not to the point where they were uh, put people into a tank like a big tank where they're cleaning the the product itself. So if you got to get into the parts per million, that, that takes the beyond your confined space permit. That's one more section you have to add to your permit. If you're going to get into a dirty tank to clean the tank, per se, uh, the refineries and, and things like that, that, that takes it one more step further than what we're doing in our tank truck industry as far as cleaning, mechanical, uh, repair, or what have you. So that becomes a whole different uh, um, section than your permit. That, that you're actually trying to make that uh, an atmosphere that you can get into safely. And if it deems you cannot, you have to uh, don uh, your pp and &E, and more than likely you have to have uh, breathing air on that person that's getting into the, uh, the tank if you deem that the, the parts per million is over 
the amount for uh, does that does that make it clear? Yeah, that's a good one. And one other thing that I didn't mention uh, during the presentation was to address the stratification issue. When you're testing the trailer, you want to test it in more than one location, kind of the top, the middle, and the bottom of the trailer as well. So that way you're 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 making sure that you're that you're addressing all areas of the trailer. So we're trying to minimize the risk that there's a pocket somewhere that we're not familiar with. And, and also it's a good practice to wear the, the smaller um, man down monitors while the uh, operators inside that trailer because there is times I mean he may be working you may have tested that trailer and he's in there maybe maybe he's scraping or maybe he's uh, repairing and just he's working and just just the normal breathing can deplete that oxygen in that tank if he's in there for any period of time so the constant monitoring of that uh, atmosphere um, must um, must be done in and what our permits are only good for two hours. So if you can't get anything you done in two hours, then you're getting out and you're going back through the whole permit session again. So that should be developed into your plan. Whatever type of work you're doing at, at, at the type of facility or the type of work that you're performing, you have to adapt your confined space um, program to that. Great. Um... We've got uh, a couple other uh, questions. Uh, first, Travis O'Banion asks, uh, can we discuss uh, alternatives to putting someone inside the tank, camera systems, uh, or other methods of avoiding having to put a human being inside the tank at all? Travis, great for answering that question. There's, there's a few Anytime things. we can engineer out. Go ahead, Lance. Go ahead, Dan. I've been talking this whole time. Why don't you go ahead? Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Anytime we can engineer out not putting someone in the tank, that that is we, – we must do that. We must find ways to not put people in tanks. And uh, the camera system that Travis is talking about, we're testing those. Um, there, there's, there's great documentation. The camera systems that we, we have now uh, available to us, the new technology, is, is great, great um, – Anytime, like I said, anytime we can engineer out by putting somebody in the tank, that's that's what we need to do. Whether it's cleaning processes, uh, whether it's uh, anything we do to keep someone out of the tank, that's that's a win for everyone. Conceptually, cameras are how we handle a lot of different things. I mean, we may put take outside of this industry, we may put a drone somewhere where we don't want people to be. So robots, drones, those kind of things attached with a camera, um, those kind of things just conceptually are where we'd like to be uh, to make sure that we, we don't have to send people inside of there. Excellent. I don't mean to get um, all Star Wars looks like on we've you. got time for maybe one or two more questions. We've got one from Darren Reuter uh, asking about what needs to be done to secure the trailer while conducting a confined a confined space entry so the trailer doesn't move uh, as well as so that there's no attempt to leave while the entrance inside great question Darren that's your lockout tag out procedure yeah, uh, some people know. some people put chains Lance you there some people put chains across some people use kingpins uh, people block uh, you know chalk the wheels yeah I'm here Go uh, whatever it takes to keep from um, that trailer from being hooked to or moved, um, that should be in your lockout tag out type procedure. I think Dan's running into some technical difficulties yeah. there with his audio, but what he mentioned that some folks would put chains across uh, into the bay of the facility. There's also things like obviously you see Well, I, it, it does look like we're, we're having a little bit of audio trouble there. Uh, um, but, uh, Dan, you do, you do seem to be coming through. We've got one last question from Kayla Feaster. How do you suggest properly venting a tank that has only one compartment hole? Boy, just FYI, I think, I think Dan's running into some audio issues, and I'm having trouble hearing you as well. Thanks, Lance. 
Um, that's one of the reasons we're, we're, we're closing things out here um, is the possible audio issues. But it seems like we've got a good connection now. So you want mind taking this last question? I think the one that I see is uh, was the comment from from Mark Ellison was um, one way of and this is a very good point is engineering out the entry uh, which he's calling dig outs I like that term there um, but you got to wash the trailers on a regular basis you don't wait till the material builds up uh, and then you really have to dig these things out so if we wash something on a regular basis we don't have to get in there and and actually just scrape the sides of the trailer um, to take out that material but regular washing can prevent the need for an entry down the road because we're going to be cleaning it um, frequently versus waiting till it gets to a point that it takes a lot to clean it. That's the last one that I saw there, Boyd. Thanks so much, Lance. Um, with that, I want to put my thanks out there both to Lance Hagler of TriMac Transportation and Dan Wright of the Keenan Okay, Advantage well, I can't group. hear Boyd, they have so uh, if everybody can hear me, I appreciate uh, and we appreciate everybody's time. Um, I know everybody's very busy, but this is an important topic, uh, something just protecting uh, the folks who clean our tanks are just such a vital piece of the supply chain is really important. So we appreciate everybody's time, uh, all the comments, all the questions that we received. Thank you very much, and everybody have a safe rest of the week. Thank you. All right. Now, I should be hearable by the rest of you. I uh, do want to thank everybody um, and go ahead. Uh, at, for those that can hear what's going on, the software says that I, I'm here. I want to let you see what the future webinars hold. Uh, we're going to have uh, an introduction to the liquid cargo database uh, that helps carriers figure out what's going on uh, with the corrosivity of various substances they may be transporting. Uh, we'll also be looking into uh, an introduction to the American Logistics Aid Network. Uh, that's with Kathy Fulton. Uh, that will be explaining uh, exactly how you can get involved uh, in disaster response as well as the tax benefits attached to that. Um, again, our thanks to Lance and to Dan. And finally, of course, to all of you for coming out today. Uh, with that, uh, we are in fact uh, done. Anyone that has questions uh, about uh, NTTC, Tank Truck University, future webinars, etc., please feel free to visit 703-838-1960 or email us at nttcstaff at tanktruck.org. Um, and with that, we're going to call it as done for the day. Have an absolutely wonderful day, everybody. And uh, we very much appreciate time.